Yeah, welcome everyone and welcome Stephanie. It's my great pleasure to welcome Stephanie Boyce, President of the Law Society of England and Wales, as our keynote speaker at our legal prayer breakfast today. Stephanie Boyce is the 177th president, the sixth female, the first black office holder and second in-house lawyer in almost 50 years to become the president of the Law Society of England and Wales. I first met Stephanie in 2019 at an in-house lawyers event and she was extremely approachable, knowledgeable about the profession and clear on her aims for her tenure. At this point, I knew that it would be good to introduce her to Chaplaincy Plus and our members here in Birmingham and wider afield now that we're online. I thought it would be particularly key to do so a year on from the anniversary of the death of George Floyd, which has impacted so much on the legal profession, the West Midlands and the world as a whole. As our Legal Prepare Breakfast in particular this year, I've started to cover COVID-19 and the impact on legal leaders. And, and how the pandemic has impacted everyone in the past year. I thought it was particularly poignant uh, that Stephanie speak today about how it's impacted her, but also the key event of the murder of George Floyd and racism, which, is, which black people face as well. So without further ado, Stephanie is here to talk about race, equality and the law. Thank you very much, Thank you very much. Much. for that introduction. Uh, can I say it is an absolute pleasure to be able to speak to you all today, even if it is just virtually. But I'm, hope, I'm hopeful uh, uh, that as time passes, that we will have the opportunity to meet face to face. So I'm going to focus my talk today on the issue that is very close to my heart, and that is of diversity and inclusion, both in the legal profession and in wider society. And I hope you will find what I'm about to say inspiring, but also challenging. But before I start, I thought I would take a little time to talk about myself, my background and career in the law, and my priorities as the first ever person of colour to be president of the Law Society of England and Wales in its entire history. So I took on my role as president of the Law Society in March this year. And a month from today, I will be marking my 100th day in office. I'm proud to be the first person of colour to hold this post, as well as the second in-house solicitor in almost 50 years. With this background, I hope to bring a fresh perspective and an understanding of the experiences of underrepresented groups and what more we must do to support them. I also hope through my experiences and that of many other of our members to provide proof that no matter what the challenge or how insurmountable the odds appear to be, it is possible to succeed if you are determined and passionate. So my journey into the profession was not necessarily conventional, nor was it without its obstacles. In 1985, my family relocated to the United States of America. And even though I lived there for the next six years, I always knew I would return to the UK to study law. So in 1991, a day or so after finishing high school, I returned to the United Kingdom and so began my legal career. However, I stumbled upon my first barrier upon discovering that my US qualifications would not be recognized here in the UK at that time. However, thanks to the access to qualification route, I was able to enter London Guildhall University in 1996, where I graduated with an LLB honors in politics. After that, I progressed to the legal practice course at the College of Law in Guildford. But securing a training contract was not an easy task. However, thanks to the steadfast encouragement of my father, I secured a placement with a local firm here in Buckinghamshire, Forward and James. I qualified in 2002 and joined my first in-house team a few years later in 2004. In 2010, I completed a master's degree in public law and global governance at King's College, University of London. As a person of colour, I'm keen to use my presidency to help create a more diverse and inclusive legal profession. If nothing else, by the end of my presidency, I hope to be able to say that I left behind a profession that is more representative of the country it serves than the one I found when I first entered it. 
Diversity and inclusion is therefore at the very heart of what I want to achieve over the remainder of my term. And in the same week that we mark the anniversary of the death of George Floyd and the global movement for racial justice that it sparked, I think now is a good time to reflect on the scale of the challenge facing us and the work we are doing in the legal profession to meet this challenge. The Black Lives Matter movement has brought the issue of racism to the forefront of all of our minds. In the past year, we have seen people from all corners of our society take up the call to action, from Premier League footballers taking the knee before a match, to educational institutions committing to revising outdated curricula, to ordinary people marching in their thousands for justice. And this social movement has grown to encompass businesses and employers too. In the post Black Lives Matter movement, there is now an increased expectation on firms, organizations to demonstrate a proactive approach to eradicating inequalities and creating inclusive working environments. And rightly so. Cynics will claim that this is all for show, that corporations have no right to be moralizing. But let's be clear, the fight for racial justice cannot simply be left at the door when we go to work. As Martin Luther King Jr. said, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. This is true of the workplace, just as it is of anywhere else. Employers and employees alike have a responsibility to uphold the values of fairness and equality in the workplace, just as we would expect them to do so outside of their work. It is right, therefore, that firms and organizations take a long, hard look at themselves and are honest with themselves and their employees about the challenges they need to face up to in order to create a truly inclusive working environment. From my own experiences and the experiences of many Black, Asian and minority ethnic solicitors I have had the pleasure to speak with and meet with, I am certain that every firm and organisation can find ways to make improvements so there are no excuses for inaction. For my part, I see it as a crucial part of my role to support law firms and in-house legal teams to identify and address these challenges. And as such, this is the guiding mission of my presidency. To be able to address those issues, we need to know the full extent of the problem. And that is why the Law Society recently conducted a research project looking at the career experiences of Black, Asian, minority, ethnic solicitors and seeing how these compare to their white colleagues. The results of our research were published in November 2020 and they paint an illuminating picture. Looking behind the headline figures for representation, our findings shone a light on some of the impacts of inequality in our profession. We found, for example, that Black, Asian and minority ethnic solicitors are particularly underrepresented in the largest firms, with only one in 10 solicitors at these firms who are Black, Asian, minority ethnic background or who come from a Black, Asian, minority ethnic background, compared to one in four at small firms and solicitors from these backgrounds are twice as likely to be sole practitioners. Be in no doubt that these figures do not simply reflect different career choices, such a stark contrast can only mean there is something systemic at play which results in fewer non-white solicitors making their careers at England and Wales' largest firms. We found the same situation at partner level with Black, Asian and minority ethnic solicitors making up a far smaller proportion of partners at the largest 50 firms than at smaller firms. More strikingly, we found there has been little progress in, in this respect in recent years. The proportion of partners from these backgrounds at the largest firms has only grown 1% since 2014. The pay gap is unsurprisingly a significant issue too. Black, Asian and minority ethnic solicitors earn less per hour and work more hours per week than their white colleagues. And the research has also revealed less visible inequities in the profession, with Black, Asian and minority ethnic solicitors far more likely than their white colleagues to experience stress, discrimination, 
or bullying in the workplace. These challenges are faced by people from all kinds of diverse backgrounds, but the specific experiences solicitors have in facing these challenges differ significantly between groups. As such, lumping people together under an umbrella term such as BAME is not helpful. We have to be prepared to acknowledge the differences between people and address their experiences in their own terms. So there is a problem in our profession. The important question is, how do we fix it? Fortunately, there are a number of steps that firms can take right now to start tackling the issue. First, we can improve prospects for entry to the profession, the talented people from diverse backgrounds, fair recruitment practices such as blind shortlisting or contextualised recruitment are absolutely key. And setting clear targets and pushing for diverse shortlists will help to move us in the right direction. Second, we need to do better at retaining, developing and progressing talented solicitors from different backgrounds. Representation is critical. So monitoring statistics on the representation of different groups at your firm and organization, including at partner and board level, is non-negotiable. But in addition, firms, organizations can do more to ensure that all their employees feel supported and encouraged to be the best that they can be. Early and mid-career solicitors can benefit greatly from having a mentor that they can learn from. And so firms, organizations can look to foster mentoring relationships through formal programs. Importantly, firms, organizations should also try and identify black, Asian and minority ethnic figures who can act as mentors as their specific career experiences will equip them particularly well to support more junior colleagues from similar backgrounds to deal with the same experiences when they have them. Firms and organisations should also try and stringently monitor allocation of work and development opportunities to ensure that every employee is getting the same access to these opportunities for growth. Third, we can start to promote a more inclusive atmosphere in our workplaces. Firms and organisations should encourage open and frank conversations about race and senior personnel should be encouraged to lead these. Diversity training for staff too can improve, can prove invaluable. And having just spoken about traditional mentoring schemes, firms, organisations can also promote reverse or reciprocal mentoring through which black, Asian, minority, ethnic staff can help senior personnel develop as allies and inclusive leaders. And fourth, we need to take a more rigorous approach to data collection and evaluation. We have previously seen how much of a difference mandatory reporting of gender pay gaps can make for women in the workplace. There is no reason why firms and organisations should not be equally as open in reporting ethnicity pay gaps and other related statistics. Openness helps to foster a constructive conversation and will encourage leaders to make rapid progress where it is most needed. In addition, Collecting and using data on diversity and inclusion at your firm and organisation can help you to identify problem areas, design appropriate interventions and evaluate their impact. The feedback that data provides will make sure we keep moving in the right direction and we don't end up neglecting areas where focus is needed. There is also plenty we can be doing at an individual level to promote equality in our workplaces. And if any of you want to help make a change, but are unsure where to start, perhaps you could begin by exploring how you can act as an ally for your non-white colleagues. The Law Society has guidance on its website on how to become an inclusion ally. And I would encourage you all to take a look. Even small steps, like taking the time to reflect on any unconscious biases you may have, and how these can affect colleagues or calling out overt discrimination when you see it can make a big difference. I am always happy to support members of the profession who want to make progress on these issues 
And my door is always open to those who have questions or, or are looking for guidance. So on that note, if any of you listening today want to take action at your firm's organisations, but feel like you need advice on how best to do so, I would strongly encourage you to get in touch with, and I can put you in touch with colleagues at the Law Society. Equality and inclusion is a challenge for all of us, not just some of us. And it's vital that we all get involved and play our part. Thank you.